cannot abide. In your fellowship is fullness of joy, beneath thy smile is peace of conscience. By thy side no fears disturb, no apprehensions banish rest of mine. With thee my heart will bloom with fragrance. Make me meet through repentance for thine indwelling. Nothing exceeds thy power. Nothing is too great for thee. Nothing is too good for thee to give. Infinite is thy might. Boundless thy love. Limitless thy grace. Glorious thy saving name. Let angels sing for sinners repenting, prodigals restored, backsliders reclaimed, Satan's captives released, Blind eyes open, broken hearts bound. The despondents cheered, the self-righteous stripped. The formalist driven, driven from a refuge of lies. The ignorant enlightened. And saints built up in their holy faith. I ask great things of the great God. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and you are a great God. And I ask that you teach us because you are a great God. Thank you that you love us enough. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm thinking that quite a bit of us are sick and without and blah, blah, blah. So, you all get to talk to me this morning. <laughs> and because there's only half of you, that means that, oh, I feel so bad. I Okay, we'll go with it. Okay, chapter one is about. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Chapter two is about. What? Fulfill. Fulfill. Promise fulfilled. Chapter three is about. Boldness. Chapter four and five. Trouble. 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 Uh, six. Who are the main characters in six? <laughs> Stephen. So what's happening in six? What was the first squall, first reported squall? Taking care of the widows. Yeah, those people are getting more attention than we are. So that kind of sounds like your kids, right? You give them more attention. You love them. We used to say, yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> um, seven. Oh, wait a minute. Who gets, who gets whacked? That's my terminology for who dies. <laughs> yeah, what? I'm hearing it. Ananias and Sapphira, why did they why did they die? They lied and they who? Who did they lie to? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Um, what did they try to portray? Hmm? Good, deeds. Good deeds. They tried to say, hey, we did this, and instead they did this. And they were trying to show the whole church that they were just as good as Barnabas. Then what happens? Oh, so who did they pick? What did, who, did, who did the apostles pick? How many of these guys? Seven. And the first one shows up right away. Who? Stephen, and then there's six more. Um, which one can you pronounce? Philip. Philip. <laughs> and the rest of them are names. For one of them, I'm just nicknamed Nick at Night, but I have no idea who it really is. Um, so we come to the end of seven, and what is happening to Stephen? Big one? 
Yeah, so he gives this great big long history lesson. What's the response to the history lesson? They stone him. They stone him. Um, I always is amazing to me that this is okay in this culture. Like they didn't get thrown in prison for murdering somebody. It was more acceptable to get rid of somebody. I, it's, it's just all twisted in my brain. I haven't quite figured that out. Um, so what is Stephen's response? Yeah, he says, Father, do not hold this sin against them. What does he see? He sees the Son of Man seated where? At the right hand of the Father. So am, is, is this angle sad? Like some of you look like you're twisting your neck. Should I go up one more? No. <laughs> okay, I'm good. All right, so now we are going to hmm, two things. One, the book of Acts. I told you originally covered roughly from 32 to 62. Give me. Chapters 1 to 8, 1 through 8, um, cover a year, two years, three years tops. And then all of a sudden from 9 to 25, we're covering the other 27 years. So, um, as you're reading the book of Acts, you're going to see, and Paul uh, rode a ship, or whatever you say about that, to Caesarea Philippi. And it's going to feel like that just happened, like we're used to getting on a plane, but it, it's over time. So just right now, we're in a bing, 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 bing pattern. But then it's going to be a long, long, long path. Okay, so just get your brain wrapped around that. Now, here's my next question. At this point in church history, what is the reputation of the church? Respected by everyone. They're respected by everyone. And within the church community, how would you describe them? Unified. Hmm? Unified. Unified. Um, what did Jesus pray in John 15, 16, 17? That they would be one. That they would be one. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and 12 and 13. So Paul wrote this book. Um, the letter to the church at Corinth. We have two of his letters to the church at Corinth. Um, he actually wrote three. One got lost in the weeds of antiquity. But the church at Corinth um, was a particularly naughty church. Um, so Paul is always writing to them going, get your act together, get your act together, get your act together. So 1 Corinthians 11, he's saying, this is just a big overview, he's saying, look guys, you're coming to communion and you're drunk. You're coming to the meal that we're supposed to all have together and you've already eaten and you're sitting there and you're drunk and you're burping and you're just a general mess. You know, like a bunch of teenage boys being at your house for dinner. That was the church of court. And he's saying, you need to get your act together. Then he's saying in um, chapter 12, he's saying, you're fighting over spiritual gifts. You're fighting over anything that you can find yourself to fight about. And then, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ individually members of it. God has appointed in the church all these things. You are fighting over gifts, you're fighting over tongues, you're fighting over, you're just fighting. You're a general mess. And then we come to 1 Corinthians 13, which everybody hears at a wedding. 
but this passage has zero to do with marriage. I mean, only in the applicably broad sense. This has nothing to do with weddings and marriage. This has how we are to be one. And Paul says, um, 1 Corinthians 12, starting at 31. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a what? Have you ever been around a gong? Remember that gong show? I'm totally showing my age. So funny story, my kids were part of an orchestra um, growing up. They were... The orchestra was excellent, but there was a passage in the music that they were playing that the orchestra could not get for the love nor money. And they were, uh, they were at a, um, where you get judged, like a guild kind of thing. And the conductor was like, we're going we're gonna to get docked on this passage. We're going to get docked on this passage. And so he goes, here's the deal. And he looks at the guy that's in charge of the symbol, the gong. And he says, when we get to these measures, I want you to kick it. <laughs> so it covers up all the lot of mistakes. <laughs> that's what they did. <laughs> it says, if I speak of the tongue of men of the angels, I'm just a big fat gong. I'm covering up everything with noise. If I have prophetic powers, if I know everything, if I can understand everything, if I have all the faith in the world so that I can remove mountains and I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything I have, if I was Ananias and Sapphira plus a whole bunch of other stuff, if I give my body to be burned and I don't love the people around me, I'm squat. So what's love? Love is patient and kind. It doesn't want what somebody else wants. And it doesn't boast about what I have. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It's not really super glad when somebody gets what's coming to them. But rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Prophecies, gone. Tongues, stop. Knowledge, gone. But we know in part and we prophesy in part. Partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child because I was a child. When I became a man, I gave it up. Now I see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. So now, faith, <coughs> hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Do you want to be one? Do you want to be unified? Do you want to be the church of Jesus Christ as he ordained it to be? First Corinthians 13. Caleb just got married. Oh. I was trying to be inconspicuous. And <laughs> he <laughs> is supposed to be on this honeymoon, but he's not. Why not? No, okay. No. Honeymoon's in March. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Which ends us up in Acts 8. Acts 8 1 says what? Who's Saul? Okay, but who is he in the story? He's a bad guy. 
you should write cartoons for kids yeah. Bible stories. <laughs> He's a bad guy. Where, what? Uh, start go back to seven. The end of seven. What? What did he just do? Yeah, he kept everybody's clothes, right? Which I kind of would like to see. Was he sitting? Was he, anyway, um, Saul approved of his execution, of Stephen's execution. Um, who else is involved in chapter 8? Philip. Philip. So, I just had this somewhat weird thought <coughs> as I was going through this. How many people were appointed deacons in 7? In chapter 7. So, um, and who were they appointed deacons to whom? So they were appointed to all these widows, right? Mm -hmm. Stephen dies, right? Mm -hmm. Philip's gone. I wanted to know if the widows got served because mm -hmm. the people left. Just an abstract question. <laughs> and on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered through where? Give me Acts 1 8. Where? In the ends of the earth. And a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem rose when? What's the time? On that day. What's the day? When Stephen died. On that day. And they were scattered through Judea, Samaria, except for who? And what happened to Stephen? They buried him. And what did Saul do? Okay, literally, what did he do? Tell me exactly what he did. Did he have any respect to gender? No. no. Anybody. He ravaged the church. Entering at house after house. Again, I'm like, how is this not illegal? Like, okay. And he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Go back to verse 1. And a great persecution against the church, and they were all what? Scattered. The word here has the idea of um, seed being sown. Um, I, growing up, I grew up with Bible story books, and there is a parable of the sower and the seed. And I, in my head, I can see this the the illustration. The guy has the seed in here, and he's just casting it out. And that's what happened here. And the church was scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. We like Acts 3 because they were all one. <coughs> Nobody was in me. We were all nice to each other, and everybody thought we were great. That's an editorialized version of Acts 3. <laughs> But we get to Acts 8, and we're not so sure this is a good thing we're signing up for. This is a sidebar from me, has no inspired value whatsoever. I often wonder when we call people to be Jesus followers, if we're telling them the whole story. Are we just saying, come to Jesus and you can be to heaven? Instead of saying, follow Jesus and there are going to be hard things. I know I've told some of you this story uh, multiple times, but it bears repeating. There was a famous... Um, I had my hand up. Sorry. What? Go. I was just curious why the apostles didn't scatter. I was curious about that too. Okay. I, 
I wonder if it's there to encourage the church that is still at Jerusalem. There was a uh, famous Chinese Christian who was born in 1900-ish. And he came to Christ through the ministry of a local church in China. So remember China pre-World War II is not communist. It is poor. It is village to village, very rural. And um, his name was Watchman Nee. And he came to Christ. And he followed Jesus intently and planted churches all over. Sidebar, if you want to read amazing biographies of missionaries, look for a uh, biography of Hudson Taylor or Adoniram Judson. Both are amazing missionaries to Burma and to China. But Watchman Nee um, was a church planter all over China. World War II came, and China was invaded by Japan, which, that's amazing to me, because China was this big, and Japan is this big. But China was invaded by Japan. Japan clearly was. <coughs> and in the encroaching years, communism took over China, because they were mad about the way they had been treated under Japan. By 1949, Communism had become the state, and nothing was allowed to happen. No religion, no nothing. And if you were religious, or if you were caught being a Christ follower, Stephen, what happened to you? Watchman Nee, however, was asked to address a whole group of local pastors that had been meeting underneath uh, great secrecy. And this is what it says. He faced a dilemma. If he spoke at this meeting, he was certain to be interrupted and arrested by government spies in the congregation. But if he didn't speak, he would disappoint those who needed his courage and he came up with a solution. He mined his sermon. Standing in the pulpit, he looked over the hall, and he picked up a glass of water, and he stared at it, and he hurled it to the floor, smashing it. And he surveyed the broken pieces of glass with a smug, arrogant expression, and he spent five minutes walking around, crunching the glass underneath. Suddenly, his expression turned to horror, and he began to sweep up the shards of glass, and he put them on the pulpit, and he tried to reassemble them, but it was impossible. Finally, in despair, he threw the pieces into the air. They scattered everywhere. Watchman Nee walked away. His sermons were done. The spies didn't know what to make of it, but the pastors understood completely, and they left less. Forty years later, a pastor in Shanghai explained the parable. Watchman Nee represented the state. The glass represented the church. He was telling us that the state would try to smash the church, and for a while it looked like they had made a terrible mistake. But the state would realize its mistake, and because in smashing the church it had not destroyed it, but dispersed it. The parable proved prophetic. When the missionaries were forced out of China, there were one million Christians. But their attempts to destroy the church backfired. And instead of destroying it, they dispersed it. And since then, China has experienced the largest revival in the history of the world. The last 50 years in China have been, in the words of this article, 
a reproduction of the Book of Acts. In all of the areas of the world where religion is illegal and you will be in prison or worse, the greatest resurgence and spread of the gospel is in China. So when we as Americans say, I have my rights, I don't want to be persecuted, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. My question to myself is, do I want what I want or do I want pathology? And when we look at Acts 8, we're going to see, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. So, Acts 8, verse 5. Oh, let's go to 4. Now, those who were scattered were preaching what? What is the word? What is the gospel? Yes. Okay, what else would those people know? The people who were preaching, what would they be preaching from? From what source? The Old Testament. Everything that they would be drawing on would be from the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit would be drawing to their mind those things from the Old Testament. Now those were scattered, were preaching the word, and Philip went to where? Samaria. So it always throws me because it says Philip went down to Samaria, except for he really went up to Samaria. So I don't know if this is a height thing or what. Anyway. <laughs> um, and they proclaim to them what? Okay. Um, what do you know about Samaria? Other than the fact that it's some um, area. <laughs> they don't get along with the Jews in Jerusalem. Okay. And why not? They were originally refugees who settled there, and they had other gods and other religions, and so they sort of followed God, and they also continued to follow their gods. Right. So they mixed things and didn't stay true to God. So way, 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 way back, um, they were part of the Civil War of Israel. And there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And then a whole bunch of um, refugees came in. People from Assyria came in because they were part of the um, conquering empire that God used to punish the um, nation state of Israel. But they settled. So then they started marrying. <coughs> but they were not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the only place that a good Jew would worship. So they made up their own worship places. And in the process, they made up their own gods. Unfortunately, their gods were calves, which should have gone ding, 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 ding. We've done this once. It was not a good idea. <laughs> and so they became known as half-breeds, dogs, um, all these things. Also, when you think of Samaria, think of, <laughs> you're going to just shrink this kind of, Think of Indiana in the middle of the United States. So Samaria was just like this little pocket within the whole landmass of Israel. Like Indiana is this little pocket within the whole landmass of the US. So Philip went up to Samaria. Why is this unusual? Because he was a Jew, and he went to Samaria. They don't touch. Literally, um, when, so what's the famous thing you know about Samaria? Woman at the well. Woman at the well. When, it, when she's saying Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans, the uh, verbiage is, has something to do with Jews don't even do dishes with Samaritans. Like they don't, they don't. This is called second degree separation. They don't touch things that somebody else touched because if you touch that and I touch that, I'm going to be as unclean as you are. 
So they were that separate. So Philip goes to Samaria. What does he do there? Tells him about Jesus. What else does he do? What kind of signs? Healing. Healing. What other kind of signs? Calls out demons. Okay, remember that in Samaria their worship was mixed. They they um, did Assyrian gods. They did a little bit of Jewish gods. It was just kind of this amalgamation. Just, I don't know if this has to do with their religion, but the woman at the well said, she said, you know, Jesus, 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 are you greater than our father Jacob? And I'm just curious, like, because we talked about Ishmael, we talked about, you know, then we have Abraham, and then I'm just curious, like, why was that the Well, so because that's the part of Jewishness that they kept. Okay. They kept their source. Jacob is their father. But then to make good with everybody else around, they just grabbed everybody else's gods. There was an, um, an, old, it's an old poem says, can I have a little bit of God, please? Not enough to disturb my sleep or make my soul at unrest. That's kind of what the Samaritans did. They kept this much of Jewishness and added a whole bunch of other things so they could fit into the culture. Maybe because the well was there and that was such a source for them. That yeah, so just... where the well was was in Shechem. And where Philip goes is to, is to this, it's called Sebast. He goes to the southern part of Samaria, which is not that big of a deal. Um, why do you suppose that? So the, the response to the woman at the well, sorry, the response to Jesus from the woman at the well's testimony to her town, what was the response of that town? Everybody believed, right? But they're hearing from Philip, like this is the latest and greatest, right? Why, did, why is there this funny disconnect? Do you know everything that's going on in Angola? <laughs> Do you know anything that's going on in Angola? Do you know anything that's going on in Kendall? We have the internet, we have the telephone, we have, you name it, right? It's that same kind of deal. Microcosm. Acts 1 8, I've given you power by the Holy Spirit so that you will spread this original little town. Didn't spread. Why do people spread? Because they're uncomfortable where they are. What's the benefit of persecution? Spreading. Spreading. Comfort leads to isolation. Comfort leads to sitting on your backside. Persecution makes you know. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not excited about horrible things. But I do know that Jesus uses it. I also know that Jesus never, ever, 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 ever promised that he was coming to make your life comfortable. So it says, and the crowds would, how did they pay attention? <coughs> Verse six, what's the descripting phrase? <laughs> With one accord, which tells you about the power of the message, that you have an entire crowd without a microphone listening with one accord. They are that intent. And they saw signs, they saw unclean spirits coming out, which that would be really creepy. <laughs> Crying out with a loud voice came out with, from many of them. <sighs> and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, and there was what? <laughs> and yeah, I'm thinking if that happened here, well, preferably not the demon part, but <laughs> the healing part would happen. Much joy, right? 
So what's the next word? But. but, right? This is the thing in Acts. When you have a disruptor, you've got a but. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a man named Simon. What was he? A magician. Okay, so a magician in ancient times would be our version, so it's not Houdini. It's more like a psychic or a medium. So, we have Simon, who previously practiced magic in the city, and he amazed all these people. How, what did he say about himself? Yeah, he had no problem with self-image. <laughs> saying that he was somebody great, and they all did what? They paid attention. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed him with his magic. Okay, sidebar, I grew up with this. Don't mess around with the occult. Don't go anywhere near it. Don't touch it. Don't be curious about it. Don't press a link. Don't mess around with your call. I can tell you that unequivocally. Don't touch it. Keep your kids away from it. Keep, keep away. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God, and what? Okay, so Acts 4.12 says what? It's your memory verse. <laughs> Under heaven. Salvation and no one else. Salvation and no one else. That's the name of Jesus. So Philip preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were what? Both who and who. So I love that Luke is so concerned that we know that this was a men and women kind of deal. <coughs> this wasn't just the guys and the women following along. <laughs> this is both convicted by the Holy Spirit, dragged off to prison for their faith, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Men and women. And they were baptized. Even Simon himself, what? And what did he do? And how closely did he follow along with these guys? Yeah, he just kept following. Kept following. What was he watching? What was he amazed at? The powers. The powers. He was really amazed at the good tricks they could do. Next characters. Verses 14 to 17. Who shows up? <coughs> who's in 14? I didn't hear it. Uh, who's in 14? The apostles. What did they hear? that the Samaritans had received the word. So what did they do? Sent Peter and John. Um, so what do you know about Peter? Tell me about his, temper his temperament. Ready, fire, What? Ready, fire, aim. Ready, fire, aim. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for those of you who do Enneagrams, what is Peter on the Enneagram? Boom. Oh. I'm going to tell you what it is and tell me about John's temperament. Tell me about John's temperament. What do you know from the book of John, from 1 John? What? So that's his, that's his, but that's a moniker of his dad. So what, what's important to John? 
Jesus, but remember he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. First John 4, 19 says, if you love one another, the whole, first, second, third John is a lot. Love one another, love one another, love one another. So very two different personality types, right? So you have Peter and John sent down to Samaria. Um, my mother-in-law was a John. She just wanted to make everyone feel loved, feel included. But Andy um, did something wrong, which was on an hourly basis. <laughs> and she happened to be around. She'd say, direct quote, oh, he didn't mean to, I love him. <laughs> I'm like, yes, he did mean to. And I know God loves him, but I'm gonna whack him. <laughs> so we have Peter, who is ready, aim, fire, ready, fire, aim. And we have John, God love him, going down to Samaria. And what did they do? What did Peter and John do? They prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. How did they, how did the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit? They laid their hands on them. Now the big question is, why didn't the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit when they said yes to Jesus? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, the, the commentaries that I read, because I can't think of this, what? Well, just one of the thoughts I'm having about that is if they are prone to believing everything. That's a very good point. You know, it's like maybe they believe, you know, I think that was one of the questions, like, did you really believe? And it was like, they, they liked, I mean, they were excited about what Simon was doing. They were excited That's about, a very good point. So it's like, did they really understand? Did they really, I'd be curious to know what the belief word was there, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, the word for belief is the same all the way across. Put your weight on. Um, but that's very, because the Samaritans were known for wishy-washiness. So, this is good, this is great, what's coming next? I, I just, I, I just that struggle because I feel like in other places we're told to just believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit as a deposit yeah. when you're saved. Okay. So, some common, all commentaries say, we don't know. Some commentaries say, perhaps it had to do with the um, Samaritans understanding the um, authority that God gave the apostles. Conjecture at best. Nobody knows. We know that. Can I give you a list of things in the Bible that I can tell you? <laughs> I don't know. What I do know about belief in Jesus, it's never static. In that, belief is always shown by movement. I'm going to follow. James said that half brother of Jesus, faith that is not demonstrated by actions is dead. And then he goes, I mean, James gives this whole list of illustrations, was not Rahab kind of justified by her actions, by what she did? Can a body without the spirit be alive? No, it is dead. It's not a one-off. Belief is always demonstrated by movement. So. That makes me always ask myself all the things, all the things. So Simon sees Peter and John laying on the hands, right? What does he say? Can I buy it? <clears throat> Can I buy it? It looks like a good commodity, right? What does he want? He wants power. What was he? 
He was a magician who dealt in the occult. What did he see from Peter and John? Magic. Wow. Yeah, perceived magic. And he wants it. What's he going to get out of it? Money. Follow the money trail. If in your life group, small groups, what do we call these things? If in your small groups, you want to talk about was Simon really a follower of Jesus? Was he, quote, saved? Go to Matthew 13 and just process where Simon is. But we're not going to do that right now. <laughs> so Peter's indictment of Simon is you think money's the real power, your heart's not right, wicked intentions, and you're bitter and you're in bondage. Okay, so typical of Peter, right? He's the guy. I can just hear John going, oh, he didn't mean <laughs> John is the encourager. He's the nurturer. He's there for the rest of the Samaritan people. And Peter's there for, look, I'm going to call you to fly right. What's Simon's response? Pray for me. Why? Yeah, I'm only in trouble. Pray for me that I get out of trouble. Instead of pray for me that I can fully follow Jesus. Instead of pray for me that I can be part of the kingdom of God. His prayer is pray for me that I stay out of trouble. What? Do you have a question? Okay, you're halfway to your Okay, so uh, Peter and John, where'd they go back? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. What was happening in Jerusalem? Persecution. Persecution. What'd they do on the way? They preached the gospel. They preached the gospel. Preached the gospel. Philip came from Jerusalem where there was persecution. He goes to Maria. He preaches the gospel. Peter and John come down from Jerusalem where there's persecution. They preach the gospel. They go back up to Jerusalem. They preach the gospel. Philip is still in Samaria. What, does, what happens to Philip? A vision from the Lord. An angel of the Lord, what do you tell him? Go. Go. Okay, where was Philip when the angel of the Lord told him to get moving? Samaria. Samaria. Where does he say go down to? To Gaza. To Gaza. I, it's just struck me how much of this lesson is straight from the news. I mean, it's just kind of crazy, but thank you, Jesus, for that. We, you all know where all these things are that fill up is because the news, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes down to Gaza. So we talked about Gaza sort of like that. So Gaza then, was that similar to like Yes, exactly. The exact, it, it was the Gaza strip. Same. So um, the population, the geography is the same. The population is different. And then, then what type of people were they? Uh, just nomadic okay. um, Arabic, Arabic people groups that kind of, mm -hmm. not Jewish people generally. So he says, go down to Gaza. What does he want? What do you want him to do? Meet a eunuch. Hmm? Meet a eunuch. Yeah, meet a, meet a eunuch. Um, Tell me about this unit. Was he a muckety muck? Was he just, what was he? High class. Yeah, and what did he do? Served the queen. Served the queen of whom? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. He's a long way from home. Where had he been? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, what was he doing there? Worshiping. Worshiping. So was he Jewish in persuasion or Christian in persuasion? Jewish. Jewish. So, where is Ethiopia? Africa. Where? So, I'd love to be able to draw, and I can't. So, you know how there's that just kind of a wee <coughs> digit of a poke out? Mm -hmm. That's a technical term. <laughs> uh, Africa. Well, Ethiopia is sort of underneath the poke out. On the east side. On the east side. I'm assuming that east, yeah, that's east. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, so it's on the east side. Oh yeah, <laughs> you would know. <laughs> so it's a fairly long distance for a guy who's riding a chariot coming down from Jerusalem down to Ethiopia. Where is Philip supposed to meet this dude? What does, what happens next? Tell me the story. So Philip goes. He sees them reading the scroll of Isaiah. Right. So generally speaking, people read aloud. So likely he heard him as well. I also have this picture of Philip. Like how fast do you have to run to catch up to it? It's just practical things. Um, Whoops, sorry about that. Um, but of course, God also, after he was done. Yes, right, right. Which I wanted to know, was that totally freaky? <laughs> it's like Star Trek, being the other side. Anyway, um, so he goes to, and the spirit says, go talk to it, right? So what does Philip do? He goes over, and but what does he do? He asks a question. He doesn't run up to the Ethiopian eunuch and say, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what happened in Jerusalem. And he just asks the question. I just uh, was recommended a book to read, which I haven't started yet, called Questioning Evangelism. And again, it's one of those emphasis on the wrong syllables. It's not saying we should question evangelism. It's saying we should do evangelism by asking questions. And if you go through Jesus' encounters with people, it's all based on questions. People love to be asked. I love it when somebody asks me a question. And so Philip goes and says, hey, what you read? And what's the answer? Yeah. So we start a conversation, right? The eunuch says, I'm reading Isaiah, but how the heck am I supposed to understand this without anybody telling me what he reads? There was an old cartoon, Snoopy in the Beat No. Here I am, it's a day that's torn to show up. I can tell you. Wonder Dog? Yes, yes, yes. Wonder Dog, Wonder Dog, Wonder Dog. Yeah, yeah. And Philip, so what does this tell you about Philip? He's ready. He is ready. He is ready. Uh, Act 6 3, tell me about what, what characterized Philip. He was wise, full of, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, men of good character. He was prepared. So he uses his preparation. Does he? Actually, I love, so in chapter 8, verse, where is it? Philip goes down and he reads the passage. Uh, chapter 8, verse 35. What's the first one, two, three, four, five words? Then Philip opened his mouth. Sometimes that's half the battle. When somebody has a question, <coughs> open your mouth. Talk about Jesus. Who had prepared the Ethiopian eunuch to hear the words of Jesus? God. God. What was Philip in this process? What was it? He was used by God. I mean, all I could come up with, bad word. He was a tool. God used him. Would God have used somebody else to reach that Ethiopian eunuch? Ethiopian eunuch? Sure. Yep. But Philip was rewarded for his faith, for his obedience, for 
all of these things. And then God did what? He took it. That some tongue that I have no idea how to pronounce. Which is also in the news. Which is also just show, just south of Ashkelon, where the Gazas, the terrorists from Gaza first bombed Israel. All of these towns are in the news. Now, here's my next question. Has there ever been a point in your life where you know that God is telling you to talk to somebody? So I have a friend, sorry to know I'm gonna use you as a prop. I have a friend that says the Holy Spirit does this. He doesn't whack you over the head like a whack-a-mole. He just Well, in our times, they just want to say, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the Holy Spirit. If that comes to your mind, you go. Um, some of you know that I have become friends with uh, Golshan Golshan. Golshan uh, greets at the doors wherever they are at the 9 o'clock Sunday morning services. Golshan is from Iran. She came to Pathway, she and her husband, because they had been in Germany for a year and a half, and when they decided to move to the States, because her husband, Padron, was getting um, his next degree, the people in Germany told them, go to a Christian church. They will take care of you. Like, seriously? But the reputation of the Christian church for that group of Germans was Acts 3. So they came to Pathway, and um, they went to life at Pathway just because they wanted to find out what the heck they were doing here. And on their, um, you know, their little questionnaire thing you gave, it says, why are, why are you going to heaven? And their answers were because they were kind to animals. Not going to do it. Because they were kind to animals. And so over the course of the next two years, um, Brent and I had spent time with Golshan and Golshan. Golshan and Pedron. And she wrote me, it's funny what God does. I was literally walking out the door that way on a Sunday morning, and Golshan and Badram were talking to Brent as part of the Life of Pathway thing. And I just stopped. I had no idea why. And I said, hey, who are you? They told me their story, blah, 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 blah. And I said to Golshan, hey, you want to grab coffee? I mean, she has no driver's license. She has no nothing. She sits in an apartment all day long by herself. An Iranian woman in Fort Wayne. And she came to Jesus. So she and I went through. I said, Golshan, do you want to do you want to go through examining? Like, there's a seven-week Bible study called Examining the Claims of Jesus Christ. And it, everything's right there. You just go through it. She said, I would love to. And we just walked through what it meant to come to Jesus. Afterwards, she said to me, you are my spiritual mother. <coughs> you are the one that brought me to Jesus. So I said, do you want to go? She's taking a whole bunch of online classes. Do you want to go through the next one? No, I'm so busy, blah, blah, blah. But you still don't show up here at Pathway. So, um, the last week, Golshan has been on my brain. I can't get rid of her. So, I, and I, my schedule lately is bizarre, but uh, I thought, this is such a Philip thing, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I texted her, I said, hey Golshan, been thinking about you, this was Tuesday. Been thinking about you, want to grab coffee sometime. Thinking maybe she'll say in two weeks. I'd love to do that. Tomorrow would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so I get coffee. I said, Golshan, how are you 
doing with Jesus? She said, well, I don't exactly. I, I probably should get encouraged. I said, bullshit. Read through the Gospel of John. Take six verses at a time. Read it in Persian. That's fine. And then ask yourself, what does this tell you about Jesus? What does it tell you about God? And where do I need to adjust? And I said, we're going to text you. Not only four days or so. Are you reading? What are you learning? I'd love to answer questions. It's not much. It was kind of a weirdo conversation <coughs> that started there. But God had prepared a group of people in Germany to plant Goshen and Padram, who are now volunteering as greeters on Sunday morning from Iran, God did all the work. He moved them from Iran to Germany to Fort Wayne so they could hear about Jesus. There are people in your life that you have no clue that they're there. And a simple question about, you want to grab a cup of coffee? We'll start a conversation. We'll start questioning. So that you can give the amazing answer of all time. Be aware. Hear the Holy Spirit because God I will give you the Holy Spirit to give you power to spread the gospel where you are, where you're going, where you don't want to be, where you don't even know about yet. I have no clue I was going to meet somebody from Iran in the middle of that way. Move it! But Jesus does. Heavenly Father, you do the strangest things. And you have given us power. And that power is the gospel of God. You have given us it to give to other people, not to sit on it. So help us to hear your voice. Help us to feel the nudge and say yes instead of would you go away. And then show us what you're doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13, where Simon saved.